this, I think. That was awesome. <laughs> uh, well, I'm really excited to announce uh, Women's International Week, really. Um, very excited. We're going to be celebrating a lot this week with the women. Uh, we're going to be celebrating together with the Heartland leaders, or not leaders, but the Heartland churches online on Wednesday at 7 p.m. If any of you guys are, want to join us, we'll be sending out a link via email. And then on Saturday, we're going to be having our women's night, which I'm really looking forward to. Uh, that's going to be at 7 p.m. here at the building. It's going to be a great time of us just learning about what it means to really take in God's love together. And I'm looking forward to it. Kristen Molden's going to be joining us from St. Louis. And we're going to be having an awesome panel of women just kind of sharing about the barriers and things that have made it hard for them to really like take in God's love, not just on a knowledge level, but on a heart level. So it should be a great time together. If you have not registered yet, it's $15. And we are actually going to have Shawanda in the back. If you haven't registered yet, uh, register you guys if you want to get signed up today. And today is the cutoff. So tonight at midnight is the last time you can re register. So thanks so much. I got you, bro. Yeah, awesome. Hey, so uh, good to celebrate the sisters and the women, and I uh, want to lift up the men. It's good to celebrate our manhood this weekend as well. So, yeah, we're celebrating uh, the men and the women this week. Um, yeah, I just want to lift up the guys, man. What, a, what an awesome time that was. These are good, good men. Um, good to have these brothers in my life. They're so much fun. I want to thank all the women for holding down the fort and watching our kiddos, especially those of us with little ones. But... Uh, um, yeah, clap it up. Yeah, that's, uh, for me, I, gosh, that alone, right? But um, we went in the spirit of the beatitude that we, we are exploring this month. Uh, as a church, we're exploring the beatitudes for the year. And so this month, we're starting our exploration on blessed are those who mourn, for they'll be comforted. So we know that in Matthew 5, right? And we just talked about being poor in spirit. And so we're building off that, right? And, and we are now in the second beatitude. And uh, so in one sense, we went... Uh, to, be, to draw ourselves closer to God as men, to, to mourn in the biblical sense. When you draw closer to God, there's a, there's a sense of mourning that comes with that. And we went to mourn and, and to reflect and to try to grow uh, in the areas that we've not been leading in as men. Uh, do we have a video, Daniel, did it go through? Um, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll go ahead and pray for our sermon here in a minute, but I want to show us a video here. But we, we, we were just trying to repent and be different men. Uh, come, you know, and, and God's always true to his word. Uh, we went to mourn and we left comforted. And I think a lot more than that as well. Amen. So uh, we got a video for us and you guys can just take a look at what happened. Oh. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. No music. No music. No. is push-ups. We'll, we'll just narrate. Those are the winners. Of, yep, yep. You guys keep going. Spirit, yeah, spiritual guys. Look at them. Really spiritual guys. More spiritual guys. We threw axes. We sang songs. Lots of songs. I lost my voice. Uh, we, look, we looked at the Bible. <laughs> Candid shot. Um, and Mark KP, I think that's it. Yeah. Um, not, sorry for the technical difficulties, difficulties there. Um, yeah, that's supposed to be a lot more like exciting, but amen. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> typical, typical for us as men. Let's pray. Let's pray. Uh, God, uh, we've had a lot of fun. Uh, thank you, God, that, uh, you know, maybe you're reminding us to not take ourselves so seriously, God, which, you know, amen, I think we, we, we try to do that as a church, but uh, we do want to take your word seriously as best we can. Uh, we want to be uh, obedient to your word. Uh, we want to follow through on the things you command us to do um, out of a sense of gratitude, as Sean Pringle shared about in his communion, God. So we want to be mindful of that. So please uh, speak to us this morning through your word. Remove me from the equation. And we pray it's your spirit that moves through our hearts and helps us to be the people you are calling us to be. Uh, we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Um, so obviously we got in the Bible a lot there, right? It's something that we didn't take pictures of this, probably for, for the best, but um, Jacob Risman organized a, a men's Olympics for us. 
And uh, so there was a lot, axe throwing was one of the events, which was awesome, as you saw Davion holding an axe there. Kind of dangerous, but no one died. And uh, we had a Bible trivia event that was really, really challenging. I don't know where Jacob got these questions from, but we were all failing. Uh, 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 the clinching event, right, so we had the push-up contest, which was awesome. The clinching event was a polar plunge in the lake at the campsite. Yes. And as Davion referred to that, right, we asked people to jump in the lake. All for a $10 Chick-fil-A gift card. Yeah. So you'd be surprised what men will do for a chicken sandwich and a little bit of pride, all right? And so, so some teams, there, there, there he is. He, he's a champion. He's a champion. Well, well, let's just, let, he paid a heavy price for that card. I'm just leaving it at that. Um, so, uh, so, so some teams, like mine, had no shot at winning at that point, so we just gracefully bowed out. Um, there was one team, however, that could secure their victory if they went all in. And uh, there was a sense of anxiety. They were all trying to figure out, are we all going to go? Are we all gonna? If, because if we all don't go, we can't win. So one by one, right, they're like, oh, I'm going to go, I'm going to go, and I'm going to go. And so for some of the, the college guys, it's, it's like, yo, I'm, I'm going to go in. I'll, I'll go in without a Chick-fil-A gift card, right? I'll go in just because you're daring me to go. But there was another team that was on their heels. And so there's a sense of like, okay, we're gonna, I'm going to go, I'm going to go, and it goes down the line. Legend has it that the clinch, the victory, Kevin Eppinger, the spotlight goes on him. He goes, I'll go in if one more guy goes. And so there's a silence, and Craig Nitcher comes in. Brother, I got your back. And then, and then we just, so all the teams are delivered. My team's like, we're not going to win. We're not jumping in that lake. But like, we hear this, hurrah, hurrah. We're like, what's happening right now? And it's, it's that team that just, like, they had this epic, like, movie moment, right? Like, I got you, brother. We're going in, right? And it's like Top Gun. And they're, they're, you know, they're striding slow motion to the lake. So those brothers, they got in there. This water's cold. Kevin Epperger was in jeans. I was like, what are you doing, man? You're a wild man, right? <laughs> the Craig comes in after him. It was amazing. I think at one, it, was, it was crazy. Like, these brothers just kept jumping in and jumping in. Like, uh, Vashon was wavering. He was like, I don't know if I'm going to do this. Davey, I was like, no, you're going to do it, bro. And he's come sprinting, and he, and he slides <laughs> I mean, he, he said, what? <laughs> I was like, this has gotten really serious. I'm just glad no one got hurt. He might feel some things. Uh, it was awesome. It was a sight to behold, let me tell you. We left camp maybe colder on the outside, more fired up for God on the inside. And, you know, uh, me and Lewis, seriously, me, me and Lewis Heater, we, uh, after that, we, we, we ran out of snacks. So we wanted to drive to get some more snacks for the guys. Because you got to have snacks when you're hanging out, right? And he was, he was sharing about, man, I, I got to get back to my job. And I need to share my faith. There's coworkers I need to talk to about God. And I'm ready to, you know, just engage more at work. We talked about engaging in, in challenging situations. And I'm like, come on, brother, preach the word at work then. Come on, man. And it made me think, you know, God blesses those who mourn. As you come back comforted, you come back with a different spirit. When you go to God and you take the anxieties and the burdens to him, God wants to give us courage to try things we've never done before. Yeah. And he wants to give us strength to experience trials that we never thought we would ever have to endure. He also wants to challenge us beyond our comfort zone. And before we know it, we're not just mourning, we are comforted. And we're able to share that joy and comfort and strength with others that need it. The title of the lesson this morning is, Those Who Mourn, the God of the Mourners. Turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians 1, and um, this is Paul writing to the, the church in Corinth. And uh, he's, he, he definitely challenges this church more than a few times um, between the two letters, but in this passage, we see a great deal of encouragement in the midst of all the challenges that he gave them. So uh, we're going to talk about two aspects of what it means to follow the God of the mourners and who this God is. 2 Corinthians, amen, come on. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3 says, 
Praise be to God, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles. Not just some, all of them. So that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so we also... uh, uh, so are also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so you also share in our comfort. The God of the mourners, first of all, is the God of courage. He gives courage. He gives strength. We talked about this at midweek a little bit as we started diving into this on Wednesday night. But the Greek word for comfort is much more than just giving someone a few obligatory pats on the back when they tell you they're feeling bad. And it's also much more than just sitting with someone in their pain, which is crucial and such an important need. But that word is even more than that. I believe it includes that. But it is more than that. The Greek word is parakaleo, which is the same word that Jesus used when he described the Holy Spirit in the Gospel of John as the comforter. That's just a little bit of the power behind this Greek word. Para, P-A-R-A, in that word means close beside, so to be, to be standing by someone. And kaleo means to call. So it means to be close to someone to stand by them in their trials and say, I know who you are. I know what you're going through. I walk with you. And you know what? I'm calling you higher. Because I see that there's more in you than you see in yourself. It can literally, literally be translated to call or summon from being next to someone or close to someone. It's like a close friend saying, man, I'm telling you, I believe in you. You got this. Keep going. Don't quit. We're, we're going to keep going. We're, let's hang in there. We're in this together. In other words, the kind of comfort Jesus gives us is meant to give us courage. It's meant to give us courage. That is the kind of comfort that Jesus wants to give to each of us. He wants to give us courage. Scripture also tells us that he wants to give us that comfort in all of our troubles. In all of our troubles. In every trial, in every moment of mourning, in every ounce of pain, Jesus wants to give us courage in all of those circumstances. Whenever you face a time of trial and you take that trial to God in prayer, I believe this scripture is reminding us that essentially what's happening is God is saying, hey, I'm going to be there. When you take it to me, I'm not going to quit on you. I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to be there when you take it to me. Verse 5 reminds us that as we share in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. When we take our trials and our mourning to Christ, this scripture tells us we are literally sharing in his suffering. And because we are sharing in his suffering, what does it say? It says, if we share in his suffering, we will share in his comfort. So we got to share in all of it, right? If you're going to follow Jesus, you got to follow him through the good and the bad and experience everything he experienced. We won't be courageous like Jesus unless we walk through the fire with Jesus. He can't teach you how to walk through fire if you're not willing to go through the fire with him. We will fear no evil. Only if we walk through the valley of the shadow of death with the Lord. How can his rod and staff comfort you if you don't let him take you there? The God of courage gives us a special kind of courage that can be courageous even in the face of suffering and even when circumstances don't go our way. John 14, verse 27. The night before Jesus took on the greatest suffering he ever could experience on the cross, he told his disciples, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. 
I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. The way the world says we garner courage is to take care of ourselves. Self-care, self-help, self-preservation. The world says we get courage by doing everything we can. Treat yourself, right, is what the world says. Jesus says, I do not give as the world gives. That's not how I roll. That's not how I give courage. The world would say, man, you got to be selfish. Jesus says, no, you got to be selfless. Dr. Bill Molden, who taught at our men's retreat yesterday, heard of a college professor recently who asked their students, when you don't get what you want, when you feel injustice, what's the first thing you need to do? He left it out there. And the predominant gut answer that he's found for many of his classes was, at least for this generation, was you protest. You protest. Because as a culture, that's all they've seen as of late. Right. When we don't get what we want. Right. We protest. We haven't learned how to bear up under suffering and love and serve our enemies, which is what Jesus did. Now, we don't, we don't, we don't want that kind of courage. You want the loud in your face brand of courage. Not the kind of courage that gets on the cross for your enemies and prays for your father to forgive them as you die for their sins. And this is how Satan wins because the kind of courage that just fights for what we want and is unwilling to suffer is the kind of courage that divides. We have a divided country because that kind of courage actually doesn't comfort anyone. It's not coming from a place of being comforted, and it certainly doesn't comfort anyone else. You think it's comforting? We're just shouting, yelling at each other? That's not comfort. But the kind of courage that Jesus wants to give us actually comforts us. We get peace, not because we get what we want, but we get peace because we remember that no matter what, We've got a God who absolutely relates to anything we're going through. God's rod and staff comfort us, nothing else. And because of that, in verse 4, Paul says, We can therefore comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves we receive from God. The courage we get from God unifies, not divides. Now, I'm just saying we avoid, I'm not saying we avoid conflict. There's times to say something, but there's a way to say things. And there's a place that you're supposed to say hard things from. And we can always tell when someone's saying those hard things from a place of being hurt and wounded still, or if they're healing. And if they feel a sense of peace when they say those things. Is a man or woman who comes into any conflict already feeling God's courage and comfort, that most likely they'll, they'll unify any disagreement if they come to any conflict with that peace already. And they'll unify, they can unify any situation, even if there's disagreements, if they come into a place with God's courage and comfort. That kind of courage, it's what made the centurion look at the body of Jesus after he had died on the cross, and think to themselves, surely that guy was the son of God. That lowly rabbi who didn't have a house, didn't have anything to his name, I think that guy was the son of God. Centurions said that to themselves. Centurions lead a hundred Roman soldiers. The Roman army was the most feared army in the entire ancient world. And yet to this leader of a hundred warriors, thank you, babe, thank you. This leader of a hundred warriors, he saw the kind of courage that Jesus displayed on the cross. And this pagan man who believed in multiple gods came away with the one conviction that Jesus is the only son of God. That is the kind of comfort and courage that Jesus has 
and wants to give. So why are we blessed to mourn? Because when we mourn, we know that Jesus mourned often and we get comforted like he was comforted. Paul mourned often the brokenness of the human condition. And Jesus' mourning and Paul's mourning, it forced them to pray. And in their prayers, they received a continuing source of true courage and comfort that can bear up and unify and comfort others who go through the same things we're going through. Because we're all going through things, right? Your courage, when it comes from God, it can amaze even Roman soldiers. Your courage, when it comes from God, it can amaze warriors. Hardened soldiers can be amazed by the courage of a Christian. Who is going through trials that can receive comfort from the courage they see in you as you go through your own trials? Who is a centurion in your life that might go, I think they follow the Son of God because they bear up under things with something I've never seen before. What trials are you going through that God wants to use to convince the world of the power of Jesus? Jesus, the God of those who mourn, will give his people the same courage that he had. Amen? Let's keep reading. Chapter 1, verse 8. As Paul continues, he says, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. God is the God of courage, but he's also the God of challenges. An inherent part of following the Lord is being secure and being challenged by Jesus. The obvious takeaway here is that Paul is describing a previous life-threatening situation. That forced him to rely only on the power of God. Here's the kicker. At this point in life, in Paul's life, he'd already been through a multitude of trials. And one, any one of those would probably make any of us want to quit at any time. Just list some scriptures out to you guys. You guys can write them down if you'd like and read them later. In 1 Corinthians 15, 32, Paul talked about fighting, in his words, wild beasts in Ephesus. Not sure what that means, but it's like, I don't, squabble the wild beasts does not sound like fun. (laughs) Those wild beasts could have been the riot he survived in Ephesus, as he described in Acts 19, 23. It could have been those. It's what scholars believe he could have been referring to. Who, (laughs) the guy survived a riot that was focused on him. You're like, Jesus, I, I, can you bail me out here, Right. Later on in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 24, Paul talked about surviving the 40 lashes minus one, which was the Roman standard for flogging and punishing any criminal. It killed most men who endure it, which is why the centurions were probably amazed that Jesus took it on and still went to the cross. In Acts 14, 19, Paul was stoned so brutally by his enemies that they stopped stoning him only because they thought he was already dead. They're like, ah, I guess he's done. Well, just, you know, all right, he's done. And he gets back up and he goes back into that city. They're like, he's back. They say, scholars say in 2 Corinthians, when they talk, he talks about the vision he had from heaven, the, the scholars say that that could have been that moment when he had a vision because he, he went to the third heaven. He almost died. And maybe he could have died and came back. Paul already had a lifetime, a life's worth of trauma and trial. Paul already had a multitude of reasons to mourn. And yet Paul describes another trial in this passage, the latest in a lifetime of many. We're talking real trauma here, right? And his takeaway from this most recent near-death experience was this in verse 9. After all that, all, everything he'd been through, let's read about what else he went through. It says, indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. But this happened, that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. 
He has delivered us from such a deadly peril. And he will deliver us again. On him, we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on behalf of the, for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. I don't know if, if you guys have ever felt this way in your Christian walk, but I, know I, I, I felt like I've received a sentence of death from God before. And it's not fun. Uh, for my wife and I, it was when we found out we, we had a genetic condition that caused our first daughter to die minutes after she was born. And we had no clue what the specific condition was at the time. We've since found out and figured it out, and, and, and God's worked through it. But we, we just knew it had to do with us in that moment. And we didn't know how to treat it. We didn't know where to go from there. All that, it felt like a death sentence. Like, God, what, what do you mean? We, not, we might not be able to have kids. Even after all we just went through, you're saying you, you won't redeem that? How? Why? It's in those moments where our, our faith hangs in the balance. Will we still trust God, even in the midst of all this hurt and temptation to mistrust God? Will we still trust him? Or would we say we still believe, but in our hearts, hold back from giving God our heart? Because we feel like, really, he broke our heart. God, you know, obviously, God has, sent, has since sent us a lot of loving people and answered a lot of prayers. He's been very gracious to us since then and has slowly rebuilt our faith. We're, we're grateful for everything he's done. But there were stretches during that time where I just felt like God was out to get us. I felt like he was allowing us to be tortured by this world and the circumstances we were experiencing. But this is where getting comfort and courage from God alone matters. Paul got his courage, not from the world or his circumstances, but only from Jesus. Therefore, Paul was able to see Jesus for who Jesus was, not as a God of continuous torture, which he could have after all he'd been through. My life is just a continuous set of calamities. But instead, he saw God who would continue to lovingly challenge his sons and daughters. He saw a God who, man, as long as we're on this earth, he's not finished with us. Because even after God had allowed Paul to go through all those other trials, as long as Paul was still on this earth, God was not done refining Paul. God was not done training Paul. As long as Paul was his son, he had to keep parenting him. God was not done disciplining Paul. God was not done challenging Paul. God was not done changing Paul to be more like Jesus. The God of the mourners gives his people courage, but he also gives them challenges. Because as long as we're on this side of paradise, we always need to be challenged to be more like Jesus, amen? And we can't ever just, just, just throw in a towel and say, we're, we're done being like Jesus. Well, until we see Jesus, that's just not true. So until that happens, Jesus says, man, I got to keep refining you. And it's not because he thinks you're imperfect or something's wrong with you. He said, no, I, I, I'm parenting you. Yeah, right. As Paul said, this happened. These challenges happened so that we might not rely on ourselves but on God. God is always, of all things, going to continue to train and challenge our reliance on him. Paul had lived the full Christian life by this point, full of risks, full of Faithful leaps of faith. You think if anybody earned a right to be like, God, I need about a 10-year sabbatical from, from being tested for my faith. I think I've proven my faith, right? Like, Paul, I, God, I, I think I've showed you. I, I might have, I think I've worked ahead in the class. You know, sometimes you're like, you work ahead and you got more points than you need. Paul's like, dude, I got more points than the class needs. God's like, no, no, that's not how I work. You can't work ahead in my class. First of all, I've already, I've worked ahead for you. Jesus took care of all that. So this is not about whether you, you got enough. This is about me just training you to be more like Jesus. This guy has a lifetime full of leaps of faith, yet he points to this most recent challenge as being the event, the singular event that taught him not to rely on himself, but on God. He goes, hey, I, I went through all that, but it was this that taught me how to rely on Jesus. How do we look at our most recent challenge? Is it with resentment? 
Is it within it? Jesus, again? Come on, man, I'm tired, bro. Stop. Give me a break. Give me a three months, something. Give me a semester off from the school of hard knocks. Can I, can I take a break here, you know, as they say? Do we look at it as, with mistrust or as a sign that, instead of as a sign that God hates us, do we see it as a sign that God's not done with us? Paul understood that and was okay with that, with God constantly challenging and refining his character and his faith. This is how men and women who mourn will be comforted. This is how men and women who are constantly undergoing suffering and trial can still be the light of the world and give others the comfort that they themselves receive from God. When we understand that God is a father who wants to challenge his kids to be more than what they believe they can be, then we won't resent trials. We won't shy away from conflict. We'll just say, man, God's preparing me for the next thing. We will endure like Paul endured. Yet another trial in this passage, because we understand like Paul did, that this is a sign that we are God's children. Hebrews 12, verse 4. Read a quick passage to you guys. As you know it, we're running, we're running a little bit late. Hebrews 12, verse 4, verse 11. You can read that in your own time. That talks about how, is it finally up there? Amen. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but, our, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Are we resolved to follow a God who will never stop challenging our faith? Are we resolved to follow a God who will never stop trying to change our character? Are we resolved to really just follow Jesus? Jesus was resolved to follow the Father himself, who never stopped calling him back to leading us by example. Jesus did this himself. Hebrews 5, verse 7. This is one of the best. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Jesus lived a life of mourning. His life was mourning. Isaiah 53 called him a man of sorrows. That, that was the definition of Jesus. He was a man, not of joy, a man of sorrows and familiar with pain. I would not want, of, of all the things you could be familiar with, I don't want to be familiar with pain. But that's what Jesus was familiar with. And as he mourned, he mourned his sorrows. In the presence of his father. And so because of that, he received comfort. He received courage. And he rose to every challenge. If we are following Jesus and taking our mourning and our pain to the father like he did, we will rise up for every challenge just like the Lord. What are the challenges you faced in your life that have hurt your trust in God? Maybe you've experienced one, two, or three challenges where you stood tall, but this most recent one you're going through, this one last week or last month or whatever, or this last one that God's allowed, maybe the last one from, one from last year that he allowed you to go through, it just felt like too much to keep believing that God's still with you. I want to submit to you this morning that Jesus would want to mourn that challenge with you. I believe Jesus would say to take that pain, that lack of trust, to his father in prayer. Because right now, even with that challenge, even with that hurt you feel, maybe even towards God, he is trying to teach you to not rely on yourself, but on the father alone. Which begs the question, are you taking the time to mourn and spend that deep, special time with God? We challenge ourselves as a church at our last Wednesday night midweek to focus this month on planning and having a weekly, intentional, special time with just us and Jesus. We devote at least an hour at a special place, whether it's a park, coffee shop, back porch, front porch, basement, living room, 
where it's nice and quiet, as long as it's nice and quiet, amen. And we just spend that time with us and God, our Bibles, maybe a spiritual book and a notepad. Those special times, we can't shortcut those times because that's where we learn to take every trial and see them as God teaching us how to rely on him. Those are the times where those things happen. You try to shortcut those times, you may figure out a few things, but you ain't going to figure out the big picture God's trying to help you figure out. And if you add those special weekly times over the course of a year, that's where we become like Jesus in Hebrews 5. Where during our lives, our lives on earth, we offered up loud cries and tears to God. The same markings of Jesus' life becomes the markings of our life. And we were heard. We were heard because of our reverent submission. Today, I want us to write down two things. One is, what's one challenge I faced or currently facing that I need to ask for comfort from God? What is it? Write it down. Think about it. Pray about it. Second is, how is God using this challenge to teach me how to rely more on him? How is this challenge meant to help me be like Paul? That man, this is, I'm going to rely to see just man. I only need God. These are questions I think we all can pray about. And even just ask God and and be silent about for five to ten minutes if you need to be silent about it. During those special times with God over the next few weeks. God is the God of mourners. Let's take these questions to God and ask him to comfort us and give us courage. And let's pray for courage to take on the challenge he's calling us to this morning so that we might rely on on him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Love you guys. Thank you. Thanks, Janice, uh, for that lesson. Um, yeah, I, I really liked when you were talking about how the world views courage versus, like, versus getting courage from God and getting comforted from God and just comparing that to Jesus when he was on the cross. And it's like, man, it took so much courage and for him to find comfort in God through that challenge. Um, you know, but I think, you know, even the people there were like, oh, just come off the cross and then we'll believe you. And so the world was even saying, well, if you are who you say you are, fight back. Um, but man, like Jesus, his comfort was in God. And so I just thought like, man, like that, that's powerful, right? And then even after the fact, the centurions were like, wow, truly he was the son of God. And yeah, so I think there's just a lot to reflect about. It's like, man, how is God trying to, you know, comfort me? you know, or force me to rely on him and go to him to be comforted through challenges. And um, yeah, just like in the end, like that will bring courage when our trust is in him. So just thank you. I'm going to go ahead and say a prayer and then we'll close with one final song. Uh, Dear Holy Father, just thank you for who you are. Thank you that you are a God of comforting, Father, that you you want to be with us. You want us to just, just trust in you and rely on you and um, even though you put these challenges in our way, it really is just to, to help us to grow closer to you, Father, to help us to grow in our reliance on you. And, um, you know, I pray that as we just reflect on these questions and the challenges that we have, that, uh, that we can remember that we're not going through these alone, but we really do have you. And, you know, we can get our courage from you um, just as we face just life, Father, because life, life can be hard at times. And, um, but in the end, we have you, and you're so much greater than anything else. Uh, so just thank you for your love, and Jesus, I pray. Amen.